Hi there. I'm here to tell you that stem cells are probably coming to a clinic near you, but that's not necessarily a good thing. You see, whenever people find out I'm a scientist, they usually ask me, how's this whole stem cell thing going? And I'll be honest with you, I, for the longest time, I had no idea how to answer that question. You see, I'm from Brazil, as you can tell. And, <laughs> and, we, and, you, and you, in Brazil, when you tell people you're a scientist, there's, there's no follow-up question. There's only this look on people's faces, you know? It's a mixture of sorrow, concern, a little bit of disappointment, you know? It is really the look of a father whose daughter just brought a boyfriend home and is going, of all the choices out there, I mean, that's what you decided to go with? And, and yes, and so I stuck with science. And I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to come to this great country. And for the past 10 years, I have immersed myself in stem cell research. Uh, now, uh, the, the, but in here, people are really interested in science, right? But like everything else nowadays, the only time people are really interested in science is in social media discussions, isn't it? In social media discussions, science seems to be such a winning argument. I mean, if you drop a scientific fact, then you basically win the discussion, right? <laughs> Which is basically why we have discussions anyways, I guess. But as a scientist, that has always baffled me, okay? Because if there's one thing I learned in science, is that David Freeman was right when he said, the more we know, the less we know. And the less we know, the more we think we know. So quite honestly, what people want to know is when can I go to the doctor get some of this? Simply, and it's fair. And I think there's only one way to describe the current situation we find ourselves in as it relates to stem cells. And that is to say we have reached a critical point in the history of stem cells, a point that can only be described as this. What you see is a massive number of different stem cell treatments out there. And really, the only thing between them and us are regulatory agencies, such as the FDA in the US. But the number of stem cell treatments out there are getting so overwhelming that some are just falling through the cracks. And the question then is, how did we get here? And what does that mean to you? Uh, so the first thing we have to understand is that stem cells really exist within a relatively large spectrum. Okay, it starts with your embryonic stem cells, goes through your postnatal adult stem cells, all the way to adult cells that we can now genetically reprogram to become embryonic-like stem cells. We call those induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. Now, we knew from the beginning that embryonic stem cells offer perhaps the greatest differentiation potential, which is, by the way, what defines a stem cell. It's a cell that can replicate, and given the right cue, it can differentiate into something else, hopefully something useful. But we've always known that great differentiation potential also means the greatest risk. And it's a very simple concept to grasp, right? We tell our kids, I tell my kids, they can be anything they want when they grow up, right, don't you? Except the chances of my son become a professional basketball player are probably really slim, right? <laughs> but I don't tell them that. But we also know that there are very specific conditions and environmental factors they have to be present just for a kid to become a functional, contributing member of our society. And more often than we like to admit, those conditions are not met, they're not in place, and a lot of the kids end up going astray. Unfortunately, when it comes to embryonic stem cells and iPS cells, going astray really means turning into cancer. And that's the last thing we wanted. Now, as I speak and I say, and I upset a lot of scientists by oversimplifying something very complex, there are many scientists working precisely on deciphering those conditions. And in the future, it's quite possible that the choice between using embryonic stem cell and iPS cell will come down to a moral choice. But with that being said, I have to tell you that both uh, embryonic stem cells and iPS cells represent a very small fraction of all the stem cells out there. What makes the bulk of them are really adult stem cells. And going in, we knew that adult stem cells have a limited differentiation capacity. After all, they already decided to be something or on the road to become something. But then 10 years ago, something happened that can only be described as a paradigm shift. Uh, these cells, or uh, well, better, a subset of these cells, uh, we call them mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs for short, 
were able to treat and improve a lot of experimental models of disease from heart attack, type 1 diabetes, neurological diseases, without ever needing to differentiate into anything. And after 10 years of research, I can tell you that the way they accomplish such features is by simply going at it. It's by simply doing everything a cell can possibly do. In fact, that's why we still call them adult stem cells, because you do find them at various ages, but can you imagine if they were teenager stem cells? I mean, first of all, they wouldn't like to go there because it would be boring, right? And they, would get, and they would get there, and they wouldn't do anything. It'd just be entitled that the whole disease would just treat itself because they were there. I mean, nothing would get them, right? But as responsible adult stem cells, they go to work. And they employ a plethora of different molecular mechanisms, things like genetic transfer, uh, transfer of mitochondria, secretion of anti-inflammatory proteins, secretion of growth factors that combine will modulate key systems in our body. So I'm talking about your vascular system, your immune system, and even other stem cells you have in your body. And they modulate them towards healing, as simple as that. And I challenge you to think about any disease or condition, and I can guarantee you, you would benefit from either one, if not all of these interactions. And that's precisely what's causing the stem cell revolution we see today. But that's not all. Something else happened. It turns out we discovered we can find these cells virtually in every organ in your body, including your adipose tissue, your fat tissue. So what I'm telling you is that you could have a stem cell treatment at the same time you have liposculpture. <laughs> and in a country like the US, where the number of liposculptures or lipoaspirate procedures reaches almost 300,000 cases a year, you combine it with a relatively simple method to isolate those stem cells, then you create the perfect environment for the resurgence of Dr. Stanley. And I'm not saying Dr. Stanley had bad intentions on his heart. In fact, I think we should have followed this whole snake oil thing. But the fact is that in the US, particularly, the FDA has not yet approved a single stem cell treatment apart from stem cell uh, for bone uh, restoration in some cancer cases. All the other stem cell treatments are not yet approved by the FDA. And the FDA uh, is really strict. Actually, it's the strictest uh, regulatory agency in the world. But I, I do tend to lean towards safety as well, because that's what we're li really talking about. And there are hundreds of clinical trials which are really that. They're trials, studies, uh, assessing safety and efficacy in a very limited number of patients. And I think it's, it's quite simple to understand why someone would be concerned about those cells. Cells are not drugs. I could manufacture a drug here, send down to Brazil, and they would manufacture the exact same drug. But I cannot guarantee that my stem cell and your stem cells will act and behave the same. Everything else needs to be a little bit different. And what's worse, if I can get your stem cells, I start growing them, and I give some to my colleague down the hall. A few weeks later, when we come back and compare them, they, they might be different. And the last thing is, we know they do a lot of things. But we don't know quite how to control them. Okay? And once really rare, Dr. Stainless are just popping up everywhere in the country. And with them come the horror stories. And I'll share two of them with you today. First one is a middle-aged woman a woman who saw an advertisement for facelift in stem cells. Facelift in stem cells. Now, I know a few scientists who work with uh, stem cells, none of which work with facelift. <laughs> but this physician, in particular, decided it was a good idea to inject stem cells in this patient's face around her eyes. And a few weeks later, she woke up, and every time she blinked, she heard a click. And you could think that's cool for a second until you start freaking out. And it turns out that stem cells in her face decided to turn into bone. So she needed to have them surgically removed. And granted, this happened 10, more than 10 years ago. The second story is really recent. It happened this year. Uh, there were three older patients who suffered from a, a degenerative disease of the eye, macular degeneration. And they also saw an advertisement for stem cells. And the physician in that case decided, well, 
let's go a step further and inject these cells in, inside their eyes, directly into their eyes. And a few weeks later, all went blind. And what's worse about this case is that the physician, he had the trouble to go to the FDA and start a clinical trial so he could falsely advertise that his procedures were somehow legit. And so we have really come to a point in history in which the most reliable source of information when it comes to stem cells are really scientists. And that's very scary, I'll tell you that. There was a survey done in Florida in, the, in which they asked people, how do you first hear about scientific discoveries? And out of 13 different possibilities, scientists ranked number nine, which means more people learn about science, scientific discoveries, by the way, done by scientists, through comic books, sitcoms, and movies. That's how people hear about the scientific discoveries. And I think that's largely a fault of the scientists, ourselves. We are largely a fault of this. You know, being from Brazil, I think the biggest difference between Americans and Brazilians are Americans tend to, think, take, uh, tend to take themselves a little bit too seriously. And I think it's because you guys don't have enough problems. You don't, <laughs> right? In Brazil, there's so many issues, so many problems, cause we, and we, we can't afford to make ourselves another one. We wouldn't get out of bed. But here, people tend to take themselves a little too seriously. I'm not saying we shouldn't take what you do seriously, because I think we do, and we must, but we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. And scientists fall from the same disgrace. And what we really need, I think, is science, as scientists, we need to get out of our heads a little bit and reach out and inform people about stem cells. Because quite frankly, a simple message could have prevented those disasters, and a simple message will most likely prevent future ones. Because stem cells are coming. We just have to make sure the good ones make it. Thank you. <laughs>